So I'm here today to talk to you about anxiety in an age of information overload. And I'm really happy to share some thoughts I have on this area um, and the impact that the digital age has had on our lives and the levels of anxiety that we experience. Now, while researching this myself, at times I felt a bit overloaded by the amount of information out there. So there's such a vast array of topics relating to this area that it could make for hundreds of talks. And today we'll just include some of the thoughts that we have on some areas that tend to contribute to a sense of anxiety uh, we feel when we go online or use technology. So I think this is how some of us feel at times when we're faced with living in the digital age. It is quite overwhelming. It's a journey that only began about 30 years ago and it's still evolving. And that means that this talk tonight cannot and will not be exhaustive and it actually might bring up more questions than it does raise answers. However, I hope it will result in us all taking a bit of time to think more deeply about our relationship with the internet, social media and technology and how that impacts on our levels of anxiety in various areas of our lives. I'm going to begin by reflecting on the vast array of information that we're exposed to in this age of information overload and the impact that the digital age we now live in has on our daily lives. Then I'd like to look at how the increased access to information through the internet and social media impacts on our mental health, particularly in relation to anxiety. I'd like to reflect on some of the ways that we can look at managing our anxiety with regard to our interactions with the internet and social media. And I'd also like to look at how the, this affects the different stages of our lives and how these changes, how it changes between generations. So, this man here is Tim Berners-Lee, who is essentially known as the father of the internet. And the digital age, when we're talking about this, is the time frame in history when the use of digital technology became common and prevalent. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee sent the first text between computers and essentially heralded the dawn of the internet. Little did he know the revolution that he was sparking. There's been lots of previous great leaps forward in history. We've had the invention of the wheel, the creation of the written language, the Industrial Revolution, telecommunications. But while these have been huge leaps forward, they haven't been at the same pace as has happened in the last 30 years. To give you some context, the time it took for 50 million Americans to adopt new communication strategies has, has shortened over time. So it took 38 years for uh, 50 million Americans to have a radio. It took 13 years for the same amount of people to have a television. It took four years for them to adopt the internet. 16 months for social networking to take off for 50 million Americans. And nine months for that many people to have smartphone apps. So it's really hard to believe that that's the rapid pace of acceptance of technological advances. I mean, is it any wonder that we feel anxious when we're trying to keep up with such a rapid pace of change? The internet has changed our lives in so many ways, from the way we shop, to the way we learn, to the way we do business, to the way we get our news, to the way we travel. And it's growing and changing all the time. And it has proliferated even further in the last 15 years with the advent of what we call Web 2.0. There's no actual accepted definition for this term, but essentially what we're looking at here is the online growth of, gener of user-generated content. So the growth of social networking sites and social media. And it's heralded the even more active kind of participation of people with the internet and the digital world. And when we talk about social media and social networking, we're talking about the different online sites and resources people use to connect with others, to share videos, photographs, thoughts and content, view videos online, listen to music, streaming. And if you're looking at actual kind of names for the, the different platforms, things like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, apps like WhatsApp and Snapchat, YouTube, Spotify, Reddit, LinkedIn, BuzzFeed, and there are many, many more. If we just take some time to look at Ireland and our relationship with the digital age, and these are the most re recent stats that we can find for 2017. So in 2017, 88% of the population in Ireland have access to the internet. 75% of Irish people go online for personal use every day. 81% have a smartphone. 41% of people use a tablet. And in, in direct opposition to that, the amount of people using computers is going down. It's currently at 77%, but is likely to drop over the next 10 years. 38% of people use more, three or more devices to connect to the internet. 
So it means that we're constantly online, we're constantly connected, and we're doing it everywhere because we're mobile. If we move to the UK, which would not be dissimilar to us in, in the way they react to the internet and social media, the average person out there is spending two hours online per day on their smartphone. I mean, just looking at those statistics is a bit overwhelming. I mean, given that the first smartphone was only introduced in 2007, that's a remarkable amount of people to have this technology in such a brief period of time. The amount of time that people are spending online is growing year on year. And what people do with their time online is changing at a fierce pace. So from blogging to Bebo to MySpace to Facebook to WhatsApp to Snapchat, new forms of technology are being created and discarded at all, at all the time. It's impossible for us to keep up with it. And while we had years to get used to having a radio, understanding how it worked and listening to it, it's, we got that skill mastered over a long period of time. And it's not the same with the rapid pace of change we're seeing with technology now. We've barely gotten our heads around an app or a, a social media platform when a new one comes along and the one that we were used to is antiquated. Is it any wonder that we get overwhelmed and people in some ways may drop out of using these social media platforms and technology because of the fact they feel anxious? In 2012, the worldwide average amount of time people spent on social media websites was about 90 minutes. More recently, it's now over two hours, and that is only going up. So I quite like this because I think it just represents that age gap that we have. We have the digital natives on the left, or on, on the right, and we have the immigrant on the left. So I want to talk a little bit more about that generation gap between those who grew up before the advent of the internet and Web 2.0, and those who've grown up after it. So again, when we talk about digital natives, we're talking about this guy on the left. Totally at home with social media, technology, it's a part of his world. And on the right, we have the digital immigrants who are slightly more harried and harassed and a little bit concerned about the pace of change. In this vast new digital age, we have digital natives and immigrants. And Mark Prensky speaks about that gap that exists between those who were born after the internet and social media came into existence and those that adopted it as adults. For those born in the mid to late 80s onwards, technology plays a vastly different role in their lives to those who were born before this era. And digital immigrants are those who were born before the advent of the digital age. They're the ones who've embraced technology and social media, but they see it probably more as a convenient tool for doing things like catching up on friends, looking at photos online, booking holidays. They see it as something that is a means to an end, it has its place, and they can leave it at that. It's not a center of their existence. Digital natives, on the other hand, are those who came of age in the time of the internet, smartphones, and social media. For them, this is the norm. And they've grown up in the age of Web 2.0, where they have become active participants in the digital age, and their lives are tied to it. Social media plays a really important part of their identity. And such vastly different viewpoints can create and stir up anxiety, particularly for parents who may be of a digital immigrant gen generation. Millennials, that's the generation born between the 80s and mid 80s and 2000, and Gen Z, which is those born after 2000, are the digital natives. And this can be seen by their much heavier use of the internet and their very complex, rich online lives. So these are just some of the statistics in relation to this population. 90% of millennials worldwide are online every day. 75% use smartphones at least as often as they use computers. 20% see YouTube as more meaningful and relevant than TV. 50% comment and like on friends' statuses on Facebook and other social media daily. In the UK, that group of 18 to 24 year olds look at their smartphones at least 53 times a day, and it's probably a lot more than that for many. 11% of three and four year olds in the UK have their own tablets. And 91% of UK 16 to 24 year olds have a smartphone. It's quite a lot of embracing of technology for that generation. So just, I suppose, to recap a little bit, it's a really expansive area and it could make for numerous talks, but I'm going to hone in on these few areas for further discussion and reflection. So when we talk about information overload, I'm going to look at that and ideas of how to manage it. 
going to look at anxiety and social media and how we might tackle that. I'm going to touch more on that difference between the digital generations and particularly with some ideas for how, to, for how natives may address their anxiety in relation to this technology. And also I want to just talk about the wonders of the digital age, all the wonderful things that the internet, social media and technology has given to us over the last 30 years. So when we think about how many people have access to the internet, the explosive growth of social media and the generation gaps amongst other things, is it any wonder we feel anxious? Cognitive overload and social anxiety, that fear of missing out online, or FOMO, are very real problems and result in people feeling anxious. If we want to define anxiety, it's seen as an emotion that's characterised by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes such as feelings of breathlessness, racing heartbeat, and nausea. And people with anxiety usually have intrusive thoughts or concerns, and they may avoid certain situations out of worry. It's important to remember that anxiety has been a protective factor in our lives and that, you know, at times when we felt we were in danger of, of dying in fighting for survival, we have a fight or flight response to help us to either run or fight to keep us alive. However, anxiety is also a hindrance and more so nowadays when we don't have that high survival risk attached. And in the digital age, it can be hard to disconnect from the sources of our anxiety as we have an online presence at all times. And that's particularly for the younger generation. It is worth bearing in mind that the more time we spend online and on devices leaves less time for us to wind down. And thus our baseline levels of anxiety are higher now than they would have been in the past, which is not ideal. The reasons for anxiety linked to the internet and social media and technology are many but there are a few concepts that it might be helpful to look at when we talk about anxiety in an age of information overload. We live in the age of TMI, too much information. Information overload occurs when the amount of input to a system exceeds its processing capacity. Consequently, when information overload occurs, it is likely that a reduction in decision quality will occur. So this concept of information overload, essentially it occurs when the amount of information available exceeds a person's ability to process it. An individual's efficiency in using information effectively is hampered by the amount of relevant and potentially useful information available to them. With the dawn of the digital age, we have so much more information available to us, each and every day, and at our fingertips. In 2011, Americans took in five times as much information per day as they did in 1986. That is the equivalent of reading an extra 175 newspapers per day. <clears throat> is it any wonder that that results in anxiety due to that gap between the information we understand and the information that we think we must understand? <clears throat> While we can take in a lot of information, we can become easily overwhelmed by it as we struggle to prioritise and separate it. And this results in us feeling tired, overloaded, and anxious. It would take over 200,000 years, allowing 30 minutes per document, to read all the articles on the internet. And that number is only getting bigger day by day. Push notifications and various other electronic alerting systems contribute to this by actively delivering information we didn't even go looking for. So it is any wonder that we feel a bit overwhelmed in this digital age we can become paralyzed by the amount of information available to us. The way our brains are hardwired contributes to information overload. Attention is a capacity limited resource. There are huge numbers of areas of the brain involved in attention. And all these areas involve a vast amount of neurons that act as an attentional filter, which is outside of our conscious awareness and protects us from registering information that is not deemed important. But when there's too much information in the world today for our attentional filter to, to keep at bay, we become overwhelmed. This is because our frontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex in the front of our brains, becomes overwhelmed and reaches capacity. And we begin to feel, feel fearful that we won't be able to keep up and experience that fight or flight response and the anxiety that ensues. Our brain's attention system is essentially evolutionarily outdated. Attention switching and multitasking are the new norms but we evolved to focus on one thing at a time. Now we're dividing our attention all the time. So think about it. You're in your car, driving, listening to the radio, maybe talking on the phone, signaling, looking for parking and thinking about where you're going to have lunch. Is it any wonder you might miss something and make a mistake? 
Will this new way of working affect our brain development in the future? Will it result in humans becoming more burnt out or suffering from more mental health problems? These are questions that researchers are actively trying to answer as we speak. Our brain's decision-making network doesn't prioritise information, so we tend to be swayed by first-person accounts as they're easier to comprehend. And this brings us up against the very real dangers of fake news and its influence on decision-making. Thinking of the recent scandals regarding the Russian influence on the US elections in 2016 and the Cambridge Analytica scandal are both cautious reminders of this. Continuous partial attention is essentially where we are dividing our attention between things at the, at the same time. So if you're sitting in your house with your phone in your hand, tablet on your lap and the TV on, it's that focus on being in touch and connected which results in us feeling stressed and distracted and impatient because we're feeling overstimulated. And it also causes problems in relationships in forms of a thing called intermittent detachment. You're partly there, you're partly not. And it causes a lot of frustration and anxiety for other people in the room with you, that sense of being alone but together. This digital divide, the natives and the immigrants, and how they view that sense of being constantly online is very different, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on. So how then do we go about tackling information overload? So in order to be able to get to manage our anxiety, we need to look at ways in which we can tackle the vast amount of information available to us today. So with so much information at our fingertips, we find it really hard to know when it's time to call a halt and work with the information we have. And this applies also to our use of apps and social media. FOMO, that fear of missing out, is a great example. We keep continuously checking our screens to see what other people are up to for fear that we're missing out on something. We struggle to stay focused on what is right in front of us and whatever task or event we're engaging in. Satisficing is about knowing how and when to say enough. Happy people are those who are happy with what they have, not necessarily the people who have more. Maximizers are those who aim for the best possible choice, and they're often the most anxious as a result. They are nagged by the alternatives that they might not have time to investigate. They're the people who go online and spend time comparing their lives to others and experiencing anxiety about decisions not made. The explosion of information available, available to us in the digital age contributes to anxiety for this group. The more alternatives you have, the more choices, equals less satisfaction with the ultimate decision. Essentially, we're talking about the curse of high expectations. So how then do we go about tackling information overload and moving towards becoming satisficers? For starters, we can learn to choose when to choose. We can decide when we need to restrict our options particularly if a decision isn't crucial. So for example, if you need to buy something online, visit only two websites as opposed to 20. Learn to accept good enough. Settle for a choice that meets core requirements rather than best and stop thinking about it. So look at a limited number of items and restrict it by variables, uh, the variables by which you're gonna choose. So if you're going to go shop online for clothing, maybe limit it by the color and the price range. Don't worry about what you're missing. So consciously limit how much time you ponder the choices not taken or not discovered. Teach yourself to focus on the positive parts of the selection you've made. It's a cliche, but don't expect too much and you won't be disappointed. It has its relevance here. We need to learn to control our expectations, particularly when you find yourself hooked on achieving or finding perfection. These ideas are very applicable to how we make choices online how we choose to shop, learn, do business, choose travel destinations and so on. But they don't necessarily tackle some of the other issues that the digital age has created in terms of anxiety, particularly in relation to social media. I really like this quote. The ties we form online are not necessarily the ties that bind, but they are the ties that preoccupy. How often do we find ourselves constantly checking our WhatsApps, texts, emails, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, and the list goes on and on and on. As you might recall er, from earlier, people are spending over two hours a day on their social media sites worldwide, and that is rising all the time. People describe very real experiences of anxiety when faced with spending time away from their smartphones and being un unable to access their various social media profiles. 
Often people describe mindlessly trawling through some of their favourite apps as soothing and a good distraction. But the anxiety they experience at looking at the lives of others and feeling the need to keep up is often greater and crippling. A lot of evidence is there to suggest that even though we are more connected online to more and more people, we're struggling greatly with loneliness and anxiety about keeping up appearances online. Comparison making to other people's social media profiles can result in people questioning their own lives and seeing flaws and disparity and experiencing anxiety and a sense of disconnection as a result. So, how do we go about maybe trying to tackle our anxiety in relation to social media? I'm sure by now everyone has heard the term digital detox. It even has an Oxford English Dictionary definition. A period of time which a per in which a person refrains from using electronic devices such as smartphones or computers, and it's regarded as an opportunity to reduce stress or focus on social interaction in the physical world. So the idea of taking a break from your online life, even for a few hours, might seem insurmountable to some people, but a piece of cake to others. Sometimes it's feasible to go offline completely, like when you're on your holidays, and other times it's simply not possible because the world of work, family life and friends revolves around being constantly available and connected. There are lots of ideas there about how people can take a break from their online world. So suggestions like a smartphone free Sunday or an unplugged Sunday where you take maybe one day a week or even a few hours on that day to go offline is a good example. There are now apps that exist that are, to, that are designed to try and change and break compulsive checking of uh, smart devices. These include Break Free and Checky, which reward reductions in daily checking of your devices and apps. And we need to remember that people are checking their phones more than 50 times a day. And I'm sure it's bigger numbers for a lot of people. Uninstalling apps, turning off notifications and airplane mode can also help reduce your online presence. These are some other ideas about how we can manage our anxiety in relation to social media. So for starters, take time to consider how you connect online. What do you use the internet and social media for? And how would you like this to be in the future? Check your checking. Stop looking at your device constantly. Maybe download one of those apps like Check Your Break Fee that I mentioned before. Get rid of push notifications. They they're designed to grab your attention and they create the urge to check. Use time limits and stick to them. This is particularly useful maybe for parents when trying to model good behavior online for their children. Don't make being busy a positive thing. This creates a lot of anxiety and stress for you in trying to keep up with that and also for other people around you. Disconnect to reconnect. Turn off your devices at specific times, such as meal times or on special occasions. Always ask yourself why, when you're going to go online, when you're picking up your smartphone, or you're going to use social media. What is the purpose of this? Is this something you're doing mindlessly or does it have a function? Remember the rule of thirds. Eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours free. And try and keep that balance and not blur the lines by being constantly online. Leave technology out of the bedroom. Controversial one I know and a lot of people struggle with this, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that it does affect our sleep and affects our circadian rhythms. We all know that we need sleep for our physical and mental well-being. And by simply taking technology out of the bedroom, you will have better sleep and you will reduce your levels of anxiety. So I want to talk a little bit more now about those different digital generations. So on the, the left over here, I think this is probably the memory of childhood that many people of the digital immigrant generation will remember, outside till all hours, playing with your friends. Whereas on the right here is probably much more familiar for those who are digital natives and for the parents of digital natives. <coughs> on, on devices, in the same room, not necessarily speaking to each other. How the digital natives and the digital immigrants look at the world of internet and social media and technology is very different. So I want to talk a little bit more about digital natives and particularly the teenagers and young adults who do not recall the world before smartphones and tablets were the norm. They are the truly digital generation. And we can see the differences that have occurred over the past 30 years. Although I fall into the category of a digital native, I am old enough to remember life before the advent of smartphones 
life when the internet was in its infancy and Wi-Fi was not freely available. For those who are in their teens and their 20s, they don't have that divide. The internet and the digital, digital age is their reality. Teen brain is under construction. This is one of the reasons that teenagers and uh, those in the early 20s treat the internet very differently. And to those of us who are older, we can see this as being almost a careless or a dangerous way of using the internet. Their brains are in a different stage of development to our own. So while they can appear more confident and sometimes even cocky, they are not necessarily any more mature for their age than previous generations were before the advent of the internet and the, and the digital age. They struggle with the same neurodevelopmental issues that we all do growing up. Our brain development is a slow and continuous process. And from, it happens from the moment we are conceived up until about the age of 25 approximately. The striatum, which is essentially the pleasure center and pathway in the brain, develops more quickly than the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for decision making, impulse <laughs> control, reasoning, and all those higher executive functions. And that mismatch is involved in the impulsivity that we see in teenagers and young adults. The desire for pleasure overrides common sense. And life online tends to reinforce the pleasure-seeking parts of our brains. So for example, the amount of likes a teen gets for a Facebook post or an Instagram post, or the amount of retweets they get for a tweet on Twitter, results in a spike of dopamine in their brains and is linked to feelings of pleasure. And that reinforces the bond that teens and young adults have with their digital lives and online selves. It's not until we hit 25 that our prefrontal cortex catches up and brings in more common sense. If we think of it a little bit like a car, teens are driving a car with a perfect accelerator, that's the striatum, but a cruder brake, the prefrontal cortex, that needs tuning. And this results in a different way of behaving and acting online, including greater risk taking and a desire for more immediate gratification. While the concept of detoxing that I talked about a few slides before can be helpful for digital immigrants in particular, it may not be as helpful for the natives. Sherry Turkle, in her very fascinating book, Alone Together, speaks of the concept of the tethered self. She uses this phrase to refer to the blurred lines between a person's identity in the physical or real world and their online or digital self. They are, in a sense, tethered to their communication devices, their smartphones and tablets, and they have become an inherent part of their identity. They live huge amounts of their lives online, and they have a consistent co-presence online and in the real world. For them, the concept of a digital detox is an alien, even cruel concept, as it cuts them off from an actual part of their identity. The boundaries for them between the online and the physical world are arbitrary and blurry. They spend a huge amount of their time communicating through various apps and social media platforms, and all their friends do as well. Adolescence is a time when identity is formed and is a sensitive period of development for the regulation of emotions, including anxiety, and the development of relationships. The advent of the digital age has had a massive impact on this, and we're only now beginning to see how this will play out over time. And often, you know, this idea of a life mix, this mashup of an online identity and a, a physical identity in the real world, is a very real thing for young adults. Teens and people in their 20s spend a lot of time cultivating an online representation of themselves, which is likely to be better, fitter, wittier, and smarter than how they perceive themselves in the real world. The pressures to keep up with this online version of self are enormous and creates a lot of difficulties with anxiety and self-confidence. There's also a lot of conflict of trying to marry that real me and that online me sides of themselves, which can be very overwhelming at times. There's a lot of evidence to suggest now that young adults and teenagers are developing a more outward directed sense of self. They're turning more and more to their online selves and interactions online for identity formation. Instant validation online tells you how you should feel, how you should think and act in almost any situation. And this can result in those young adults struggling to soothe themselves and make decisions independently. So as I said before, for digital natives, the way they view their online lives and real world lives is vastly different to the viewpoint of digital immigrants. And therefore our understanding of how to help them to come to terms with some of these issues that they face online, such as risk, cyberbullying, and anxiety, is really a case of us playing catch up. However, there is something to be said for trying to reduce the similar difficulties they experience with information overload and intermittent attachment I've spoken about earlier. 
One thing that I found useful for people in this age group who are struggling with anxiety relating to this life mix and their online lives is mindfulness. I'm sure at this point everyone in this room has heard of mindfulness and possibly use it as part of their, their daily lives. If we look at these definitions here from some of the experts, I would point out that the key message really is that it's about being in the present moment, paying attention to what is going on around us and also inside us at that moment in time. I also like the inclusion of non-judgmentally in Kabat-Zinn's definition, as we are highly judgmental as a rule, and usually of ourselves. In this world of multiple information sources, using multiple screens at a time, push notifications and social media, it's incredibly difficult for us to stay focused on one task at a time. Multitasking has taken over and looks like it's going to be the norm going forward. The impact this is going to have on our brain development and cultural norms in the future is as yet not fully understood. But there's certainly a lot of evidence to suggest that multitasking and divided attention can affect our mental health and result in anxiety. Therefore, the idea of trying to find small ways to bring our attention to the present, to be mindful as it were, on a daily basis could be of enormous benefit, even for those who are digital natives and think nothing of constantly being tethered to their smartphones. So, given that we've talked about living in this age of information overload and how it affects particularly, say, digital natives, it can almost feel sometimes that it's impossible to break away from our screens, our online lives, and ground ourselves in the present moment. These are just some ideas about how to make it a little bit easier to practice mindfulness. So for starters, start when it's easy. A lot of people get interested in mindfulness to help them with difficult situations or stress, and that's a great idea. But if you try being mindful in the middle of a crisis for the first time, it's a lot like trying to score the winning goal in a football match and you haven't been to a single practice game. Don't make it harder for yourself. Start with pleasant moments, practice those, and then you'll be ready to deal with the more challenging situations when they arise. Pay attention to something you do every day. So pick one or two activities you do daily, such as driving, brushing your teeth, reading a bedtime story to your kids, and get into the habit of paying attention to what you're doing in that moment. Your mind is probably going to wander, and that's fine. Just catch it and bring it back. Don't get upset about it. Just bring your attention back to the task at hand. Approach situations with curiosity. So if you're not sure how to respond to a situation, or if you're feeling frustrated, try getting curious about what is happening instead. If you think about it, it's really hard to be angry and interested at the same time. So not only if, if you're curious, not only will it help you to get out of a difficult mood, it'll likely help you to gain a bit more clarity and make it, uh, allow you to make a clearer and more informed choice or, or how to manage the situation in hand. So remember the four T's, transitions, tea time, toilet and telephone. This comes from the work of Mina uh, Srinivasan. And the idea here is that when you're transitioning, moving from one activity to another, drinking tea or coffee, using the bathroom, or going to check your phone, take a couple of deep breaths and come back to the present moment. These are anchor points to remind you to engage in mindfulness for just even a few moments during the day. Breathe whenever you can. So breathing is a key mindfulness practice because it's something we have to do out of necessity. And it's always a good way to bring our awareness to back to the here and now. Taking three or four deep breaths and paying attention to them at any given moment can help you calm down and focus. If you struggle to concentrate on your breathing, then physically grounding yourself can be helpful. So sitting down and paying attention to the chair underneath you and how it feels. Putting your hands on a flat surface and feeling it underneath you. Holding on to maybe a small object like a pebble or a key ring and paying attention to that. That and paying attention to the senses that you have, so the smells that you can smell, the sounds you hear, the sights you can see, can all help ground you in the present. Practice does make perfect. The more we practice, the easier it gets. So even just taking a few moments out of our busy lives each day can make a huge difference and help us to reconnect with the real world, but without the extreme of cutting ourselves off from our online lives. And this is why such an approach could be very helpful for digital natives because it doesn't involve them having to cut away what they see as an essential part of their lives and allows them to actually have a chance of balancing out both. So I'm not sure everyone can read this, but I think this really sums up the divide. On the left, we have four people furiously playing Pokemon Go, which I'm sure we might remember from a few years ago. 
And on the right, we have our digital immigrant furiously Googling, poking mango. <laughs> so how do the digital immigrants and digital natives come to understand each other in this all the time changing landscape of technological development? Look, it's a really good question. And I think the answers are still evolving. What I would say is that there is no need to panic. There have always been gaps in understanding and communication between generation and gaps in opinions. It's not a new phenomenon. When rock and roll music first came out, everyone thought it was going to be the end of the world and morality as we knew it. The world is still existing and morality is still here. So the most important thing that we can do is know our own digital status. Are you a native or are you an immigrant? And to reflect on what you want to get out of the digital age. So are you a native who embraces all new technologies and forms of social media with relish? Do you want to actively create content and share it online? with an online audience, maybe become a social media influencer? Or are you someone who wants to use technology, the internet and social media, for more limited purposes like Skyping family, keeping in touch with friends, and booking holidays? Whatever you decide, be clear for yourself what your boundaries are and what your rules are in relation to your digital status. Then try to take the time to discuss with loved ones and colleagues and friends of different digital statuses the, the different aspects that you see, your viewpoints and their viewpoints, and communicate around these. This leads to less cross wires and hurt feelings. Work on trying to respect the viewpoints of others and try to negotiate compromise, especially amongst families with different digital generations within them. So for instance, you might agree on a, a device-free mealtime, and then when it comes to downtime, people are free to multi-screen as they wish. And again, then it may be that, you know, Multi-screening might be okay during the weekdays, but on a weeknight, on a weekend night, you might have a family movie night where everyone is watching it in a mindful fashion. Essentially, it's all about communication, negotiation, and compromise. Coming towards the end now. <clears throat> so, but before I end, I just want to reflect on some of the positive aspects of the digital age. It has brought a huge amount of resources to our lives. Given how quickly things have moved over the last 30 years, we tend to be a bit fearful at times. Humans, as a rule, do not like change, and we take a while to adapt, but technology is moving at such a rapid pace that it can be hard to get our heads around it at times. Of course, the internet, social media, and technology can be overwhelming, and we haven't kept pace with the rapid developments as the way that we probably would like to. In fact, Tim Berners-Lee, that man who invented the internet essentially, has suggested the idea of a, t uh, of a cyber Magna Carta to try and place some order and structure on how the internet is used and how people behave using it. But it's important to remember that it has been a hugely positive influence on many people's lives. These are just some of the things that the internet has given us. Crowdsourcing of information, instant access to information, the creation of wider support systems online, medical advice and discoveries, although that can also cause anxiety in and of itself, tackling prejudice, contribution to public and social change, normalization, allowing people to have a sense of belonging and create communities for like-minded individuals. It has also helped you to keep track of your children because if they have a phone and they don't answer it, they're gonna get into trouble. It helps maintain relationships, how many friends would we have lost along the way if we didn't have things like Facebook to send the odd message over time when people live in different time zones? It can also create relationships such as online dating. This list only is the tip of the iceberg and I think that of all these amazing things that the digital age has given us, you could have a talk on any of these at any time. So just some final thoughts. Hopefully this is the place that we're all going to get to with the digital age. Zen, calm, knowing our boundaries and limits with regard to our online lives, being able to respect the viewpoints and positions of others, particularly if they are of a different digital generation. We're going to have time for questions in a moment, and I am looking forward to that. But before I go, I'm going to ask you just to take a moment to think about your relationship with technology, the internet, and social media. Are you a digital native or a digital immigrant? Or have you decided to not take part at all? How does your position on this digital age colour the way you view technology, the internet, and social media? 
And just one last thing to mention that one of my colleagues is going to be running a workshop for managing stress in May. These are the details, I'll leave them up for you to read. There's also leaflets outside and at reception as well. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. So hello again, everyone. Um, what a fascinating bunch of questions have come through the door to us uh, this evening. And I think uh, probably to, to answer each of them, we will be here for quite a while longer than we have. But we're going to give it a go. So uh, I might rapid fire some of these at Amy. And uh, between us, we'll, we'll offer you some of our thoughts about, about these issues. We've clustered some of the questions because, in a sense, the issues coming up are, are quite similar. Uh, there seems to be a lot of interest and maybe even some anxiety around how uh, people, in parents, teachers, people who are working with young people, can help them to manage and regulate their use of social media and internet content. So maybe just to give you a flavour of some of that, how does a digital immigrant, a parent, know how to impose appropriate rules and boundaries for a digital native, a teenager, when their mental health is the main concern for the parent? So that's a particular nuanced question, looking at the use of internet amongst digital natives when their mental health may be, be under pressure. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think it's a really good question. Um, yeah. Is it on? That might help. Oh, there we go. Now it is. Yeah. Okay. I think it's look, it's a really, really good question. And, you know, I suppose it comes back to that idea of trying to make sure that parents and children are communicating with each other around this, that we're opening up talks with our, our teenagers and, you know, being as open as possible around our concerns. Also, I suppose it's important for looking at kind of keeping up with technology. So, you know, there's a there's a responsibility, I suppose, for parents to ensure that they're up to date as best they can be with what's the advances in technology so that they can actually have a conversation whereby they they understand what's going on for the teenager in question. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah, I think that that issue is is critical, really. And, you know, in my own musings about this, I've kind of concluded that really it's it's an obligation for for parents or for people who have, have roles of responsibility in working with young people to be absolutely up to speed mm -hmm. and au fait with what whatever is going on in social media or whatever uh, the new latest thing is mm -hmm. um, because how can you expect to have the type, type of conversation that Amy's talking about if you don't actually know what it is and I know sometimes you hear parents they reflect and they say well do you know I trust my I trust my teenagers and I think that they'll, they'll manage that themselves I suppose I'm not so sure about that mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of what goes on online is quite difficult and challenging. And Amy mentioned about yeah. the forming brain. It can be difficult for people to manage stuff uh, mm. themselves as teenagers. So I think it's incumbent on parents and people with responsibility to know exactly what this is all about mm -hmm. and to be able to stay not just um, catching up with their, their teenagers, but walking alongside them in terms of the understanding so that they can have a truly open, frank yeah. conversation. So, um, a nuance of that question, Amy, is as adults we may find it easier to define the boundaries of social media use, but what advice would you give to younger people mm. um, who have been reared in the digital age? What advice might be specific for, for children, for adolescents, about how they interact with, with social media? Yeah, uh, and again, I mean, I think that's kind of when we come back to that idea of you know thinking about what you want to get out of the internet so it's a it's a conversation we all need to have with ourselves what is the purpose of us being online and you know are you comfortable with the amount of time that you are being online so that idea of being mindful about your usage again and maybe you know discussing that with other people who maybe use it differently to find out is there a way of being comfortable with your level of internet use 
also being aware of the risks online, you know, maintaining your, your kind of identity online is a very important part of a teenager and adolescent's life. But you have to do that within a safe way. So having conversations with parents around that is also going to be really important as well, I think. And I think maybe just tapping a little bit deeper into that, there's a question about uh, some of the comments you made around the brain changes that mm. might be present for for younger people in particular. Um, and asking, uh, is there any research that specifically looks at attention span changes mm. that might be might be evident at this point? Yeah, I mean, uh, that that question is a really, really interesting one, because quite frankly, at the moment, as I was saying in the talk, research is only catching up with this area. Technology has taken hold so rapidly that we are literally only on the back foot with this. You know, I think there's more of an awareness, certainly, of things like shortened attention spans and ADHD within a younger population. But whether that has always been there and we're getting better at detecting it, or whether it's the case that actually the way we're living our lives now is changing the way our attention spans are working has yet to be fully kind of explored. And that's where we need more research. And I think, you know, hopefully within the next couple of years, we'll have a clearer answer on that. Are we seeing, Amy, an increase in the number of younger people that are, are being diagnosed with attention deficit disorders? Um, it's certainly becoming more of a diagnosis. I think, you know, and along with other kind of neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, again, there's more diagnosis of these than there would have been previously. But whether that's just that we're getting better at detecting it and the criteria are clearer or it's a case that actually these are becoming more problematic is is yet to really be kind of, I think, fully explored. And I think particularly when we're talking about ADHD and attention span difficulties, that one really hasn't played out. Definitely there's people out there who have ADHD, but is it also a case so that people have forgotten how to connect with things mindfully and when they do step away from that online life, their ability to concentrate and attend to things improves over time again? That's something that we haven't yet seen and we need to explore further. And I think that's an interesting point uh, in relation to this whole phenomenon of internet and how we relate to it and what impact it has on our functioning because, Amy, you... I thought really impressively highlighted just how quickly this has changed. It took how many years for TV to proliferate yeah. and it takes how many months for the latest new app to, mm. to proliferate. And one of the dilemmas for people like ourselves, you know, we, we work as, as scientific practitioners, so we, we like to apply ourselves where there's evidence to back up what we have to say. But... There is a dilemma for us as psychologists because we're seeing things clinically and maybe teachers and parents are seeing things uh, playing out with their, their young people. Um, we see it with our clients hmm. where we're very definitely impressed that there's something afoot here, there's something different in this. But unfortunately, the research takes so long to get in place yeah. and to get run through so that we can have a volume of research that actually backs up what what we're noticing mm. and I think in the interim we have to work with our clinical impressions in order to try and respond to the challenges that we're meeting. Yeah. Um, I know this is something that uh, Mary Aiken that some of you may be familiar with, she's an Irish cyber psychologist uh, better known for her influence in the programme Cyber CSI on television uh, but she has she's done phenomenal yeah. work in relation to this and she has an excellent book the cyber effect I'd recommend it to anybody that's interested in this because she talks about how we interface with mm. the internet and with all that it entails and the impact of that on how we live and how we function but she highlights this dilemma as well the catch-up that we're playing as scientific practitioners in getting the research into place yeah. but she makes a number of really important observations about trends that she's seeing and, and threats that she identifies and she's very strong in saying that she would stake her professional reputation that the clinical hunches the impressions that are coming through will be supported by the research down the line so she encourages the likes of ourselves to respond to what we're seeing mm -hmm. from a professional perspective a question here, Amy, that's looking at uh, something a bit more specifically around panic attacks. 
and asking are they common for digital natives who have trouble living between their online world and reality? It's a, a, as I said, they're all really good questions tonight. I suppose panic attacks are more generally linked to anxiety. So it, it's not necessarily that it's the social aspect of social media or the internet that that's the reason for the panic attack. Panic attacks can happen for people who are not necessarily digital natives and connected online. So really a panic attack is that fight or flight response we spoke about before kind of gone into overdrive. And it is whenever we, whatever can trigger it, it could be that you are afraid of a dog. It could be anything that causes anxiety. If it escalates to a high enough point, it can create a panic attack. And so for the, the, the root cause is different for everyone. So for maybe some digital natives, aspects of their online lives can create panic attacks, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only cause of them. Yeah, and I think I think um, there can be so much coming at us. Um, Amy talked about the information overload and so much coming at us all the time with an expectation that we respond. You know, I wonder how many of us here in the room this evening didn't at some point stray to our phones and maybe to we need to text somebody or respond to somebody or maybe feel a vibration in mm. your pocket with the phone going off and there can be an imperative that comes with that that just starts to ratchet up the the anxiety that we feel and what we know is that when pressure and stress increases it can become evident mm. in in panic attacks but it's not unique to the cyber world. No, no, it's certainly not. But it is definitely something that people can experience. And, you know, often that idea of not being able to delay gratification really links to that rising sense of anxiety. So, you know, if you've sent your friend a WhatsApp, you see the two blue ticks and they haven't gotten back to you. That can, for some people, be enough to, to tip them up until eventually they become so anxious they end up having a panic attack. So everyone is different, but certainly there can be links to it. I was I was uh, in a over in Enniscrown in Sligo yesterday, and it was a lovely afternoon. And we'd been out for a walk on the beach, and we went into this wee cafe for a cup of tea afterwards. And it was quite busy. Um, I'd say there was about fourteen or fifteen people inside. And at one point, I glanced around. Now myself was included in this, so I'm not being <laughs> judgmental. Everybody sitting in the cafe had their head in their phone, including the server behind the counter. <laughs> um, an interesting question here, Amy, uh, from somebody who says that as a digital native, so they're well mm. used to the technology world, I plan to work in the marketing industry when I graduate this year. How can a person manage expectations of an employer who expects you to be switched on 24-7? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think, you know, for people who work in any of the, the multinational companies, the Googles and the Facebooks and everything of the world, this is a real issue. And we would definitely see people coming in who work for companies that are transatlantic or multinational and they're expected to work between different time zones. It is a very challenging path to navigate. Um, again, it comes back to, you know, what are your kind of, what's your boundaries? What are your limitations? What are you willing to, to be flexible on? And what are you willing to actually have to say hard no to? You have to be able to have that idea yourself going in. And whatever you decide, you need to firmly stick to it because if you keep giving in, your boundaries will be pushed back and back and slowly, but surely you'll be saying yes to every request. And it can be very challenging. But a lot of companies are getting better at understanding that actually, you know, they're, they're, it is impossible to keep going and have people burning out that quickly. So employee, do, they do have employee wellness programs and things like that. But it is something that you need to have a clear idea for yourself about how do you disconnect. So you might agree to do maybe one hour outside of your working hours for them in that respect to, to feel calls from a, the, the other side of the world. But then that is it. And you don't let it bleed outside of that. And it, look, this is very hard and it's a work in progress for many people. But if you can put in your own limitations and boundaries and hold to them, people will generally respect you for that and stop asking. And that's certainly been the experience of clients of mine when they've actually put those things in place. But start as you mean to go on. It's a lot easier to start like that than to go in with a kind of more flexible approach and try and grab that ground back later. Yeah, there's quite a, a burden on people, I think, to to f maybe feel within themselves that they're meeting the expectations mm. of an employer. 
And I suppose that can be one of the ways that we have to look at our own stress management. Mm -hmm. How much of this expectation is real and how much of it is actually my own sense of of what I I need to give. Um, I think we're not quite at the at the level of of some of the I think is it the the Japanese and maybe some of the Korean workforces where it's not really regarded as acceptable to leave work before your boss. Mm. So you have people who are sitting with not much work to do, um, but because it's just not the etiquette that they. Uh, they sit around and, and wait for their boss to go so they can take their leave. So I think there are stresses mm. at all sorts of levels um, mm. that uh, I know there's the, the joke about what time somebody sent an email and mm. is it sent early in the morning or late in the evening and there's kind of kudos in that. Mm. And I suppose, you know, we can work 12 hours a day, yep. but what's the quality of of those 12 hours mm. um, is, an, is another piece. And I suppose we answer that in our in ourselves. Yeah. And it comes back, I suppose, that idea of not glamorizing busyness, you know, it's it's not doing you or anyone else any good. And, you know, this idea of self-care, it's not selfish to actually take time for yourself. If you don't do it, you burn out and then you're no good to your employer in the first place. So you actually have to, if you feel that sense of obligation that I should because this makes me look better, at the end of the day, you'll actually get more respect and appreciation for being able to put your boundaries in place because it means you're working effectively and know your own limitations, which is more than a lot of people do. So I think it's important, challenging, but important to try and do that. I'm very conscious we're having this conversation and our CEO is in the front row here listening. (laughs) (laughs) We're here late enough tonight. (laughs) Uh, Another question, Amy. Is there a function for schools and specific educational programs in preparing children for the digital age, do you think? Oh, yeah, we had a good chat about this one inside. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we're an adult service, so we, we specialise in, in working with young adults and, and older adults in, in various areas of mental health difficulties. But certainly, you know, children spend a vast amount of their time in school and you know, getting these programs and ideas started while they're young, it gives them a better chance of actually managing their, their social and online lives, you know, in a more structured way than perhaps people who have kind of are older now. Um, I know that schools have started to bring in mindfulness programs and I think that that's kind of something that could be really helpful for younger children. It becomes a normalised part of their lives to try and connect with themselves and ground themselves in the present every day. So starting these things early is, is huge and Given kids are in school for a large proportion of the, the year, it's a really good place to start it. I think schools need to have conversations with parents around the boundaries around social media and technology. You know, I know some schools have introduced tablets as part of the educational system. And again, all this needs to be looked at. And, and again, I suppose, what, as we've been saying, research is really still just catching up with the actual advances in technology. But this, this is still playing out actively day by day. Mm. An interesting, uh, well, little cluster of questions here about asking how can we protect the younger uh, child age group, three to eight years, uh, in their use of technology, given that it's the norm for them in, in everywhere they turn? Yeah, again, you know, again, really, really good question. And again, I think it comes down to having the time to think about what is the purpose of technology for your children so rather than handing them the tablet or the the phone to keep them happy why are you doing this start as you mean to go on and and as the children age you know have conversations with them around the boundaries and around the the rules and again that idea of modeling good behavior yourself it's no good telling your kids to get off their devices if your head is stuck in it when they're trying to talk to you so you have to practice what you preach um, but certainly I think, you know, it, it's, it's a growing, evolving thing. But to be aware of your own ideas, keep up with the trends and keep trying to teach your children about this, like you teach them to read or teach them to do anything. It's the same application of that and consistency is key. Mm. Consistency seems to be the, the, the key yeah. peer part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, is social media technology addiction now recognised? Ah. Uh, 
It's a really interesting question. Uh, I, I, it isn't recognized as an addiction in any of the, the mental health kind of standards and manuals. But I mean, obviously, there are questions about are people becoming addicted to the Internet or are addicted to online kind of presence? I think, again, we need to, to treat this with caution and realize that for many people, it is not that they are addicted, it is that they live their lives. Younger people live part of their lives online, and that is part of their identity. It's not simply enough to say, oh, they're just addicted to their phone. It's much more complex than that. You know, people people live their lives in a different way now, and we need to be able to respect that and, as I said, communicate with them, negotiate with them, and, and respect the different viewpoints. Obviously, there are some people who are going to be overusing technology, but why are they doing that? I think that is the question we should be asking rather than just jumping straight to the idea of being addicted to it. Why are people so hooked on their phone? What is it about being separated from them that is so anxiety provoking? And if we can get to the heart of that, then we can understand the behavior that we're seeing, which is this head constantly buried in their devices. So we need to understand the why. And that's, that, again, comes back to the idea of communication. Yeah, and I think, you know, it probably ties in a little bit to, to next week's talk around addiction services yeah. and treatment pathways. Uh, but I suppose we, we sometimes see for people who have uh, a compulsive, excessive type use of the Internet that leads to behaviours maybe that become problematic yeah. and challenging um, for themselves or for other people. And at that point, I think we've entered a, another domain of, mm. of reality around Internet use that probably is, is another talk all in itself. Yet another one, absolutely. But um, I suppose to acknowledge the reality that, that, you know, for a small percentage of people, the use of the Internet and the way they engage with it and the impact of it on them and their own life and living and their own mental health, it can be quite yeah. significant. But fortunate for the most of us we're able to use it and not get unduly impacted yeah. on whatever about continual partial detachment that exactly that Amy talks about yeah and again i think it comes back to that idea of moderation we need a moderate approach to everything in our lives i mean that's what they constantly tell us in terms of what we eat and everything else so our use of the internet needs to be moderate it needs to have a purpose for us it needs to be mindful and if we can do those things, then we are less likely to end up in this compulsive use and mindless use of, of technology. Well, that sounds like uh, sage-like words for us all to take away for the evening yeah. um, about our use of, of the Internet and our management of that. So maybe with that, we might just wrap up and uh, once again extend very uh, warm thanks to you all for mm, coming out absolutely. i know the night wasn't great but also uh, our appreciation to amy for very fine and thought thought provoking and inspiring lecture this evening thank you amy thank you.